So we're looking at the philosophes. If you missed the introduction, go back and take a look at that. But now we're really getting into the nitty gritty of who the Enlightenment thinkers, the Enlightenment philosophes were. Now, of course, the most important Enlightenment philosophe, the one who's most likely to be discussed in the context of the Enlightenment is Voltaire, a French philosopher, author, and playwright. Uh, wrote all kinds of books. Now, he's best known for writing Candide, which of course he considered a minor work. Um, of course, Candide, I think, is the most accessible, uh, one of the more accessible books he wrote. It's very short. It's very entertaining. Uh, you know, it's funny. It's, you know, even if you read the footnotes today, you can kind of get some of his jokes. And since you've taken, uh, you know, a course in European history, you can kind of put it into context and it gets even funnier. But Voltaire, you know, wrote all kinds of stuff and he didn't, you know, if you would have told him he's going to be known primarily for this, he wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have thought that that was, uh, you know, what he would have expected to be known for, but people like things simple, so there it is. Now, plenty of other notable works by Voltaire. First of all, his Letters on England, otherwise known as Philosophical Letters. Now, Voltaire's Letters on England were written during his exile, and when we think about the context, the audience, the purpose of a document, uh, and the point of view, Voltaire was writing this having been exiled from France for challenging a nobleman to a duel. And so he has to go to England. Now, he gets to England and he sees, wait, they have religious toleration here. Their nobility is not as haughty and entrenched here, and they have a little bit more freedom. There's equal justice under the law. They have a fair tax structure. Their nobles actually pay taxes. And Voltaire has this kind of epiphany. It's like, wait, I got exiled, and this place where I'm spending my exile is actually better than France. And of course, he's got a bone to pick with the French authorities, so he starts writing these letters. And his audience, these are people who are living in France, and Voltaire's like, hey, I came to a place that's actually a lot better than France, okay? France really isn't that great in terms of being an enlightened nation. Check this out. And so he writes about uh, religious toleration in England, the support for science, the support for, for culture and letters, uh, and goes to some of the different religious groups, some very entertaining letters on the Quakers when he goes to a Quaker meeting and experiences, uh, you know, this for himself. And so his purpose here is to let the French know that like, you know what, you exiled me, but it's actually, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy, or at least I'm going to pretend to be happy. But I think he really is happy because, I mean, England really had a much more enlightened society at that point from the point of view of the government and how the nobility interacted with the rest of the country. His philosophical dictionary is really fascinating because what he does is he just gets these different topics and he just, you know, like religion or the Bible, or, uh, you know, philosophy, stoicism, anything like that. Like, he will go into different things, and it's like, it's like a dictionary or an encyclopedia, and you can look up all of these things and see them from Voltaire's perspective. It's almost like a miniature encyclopedia that Voltaire wrote himself. Uh, you know, of course, we'll get to Diderot in a bit. So the Philosophical Dictionary is a great read. I love uh, reading his uh, letter, his entry on religion, which I've actually made a video about, uh, you know, speaking of Voltaire on religion and his religious philosophy. And then he wrote elements of Newton's philosophy. And this is the thing that's kind of interesting because Voltaire is a man of letters, all right? When people talk today, you know, there are hot-button scientific issues like climate change and stuff like that. How many people really understand the science behind that? Not many. Uh, you know, people have strong opinions about it, whether they understand it or not. Now, Voltaire had strong opinions about Newton. He believed, hey, Newton is, Newton's onto something, but I don't quite get it. All right. I mean, the thing is, he's, he's somebody, he's a writer, he's a playwright, he's an author, a philosopher. And so what he decided to do was to popularize Newton, which if you think today, has anybody heard of Neil deGrasse Tyson? Of course, he's actually a scientist, but he's got tons of Twitter followers. He, he's always on TV and making shows and all of that kind of stuff. And he popularizes science. You know, people like, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, people who explain scientific concepts to the people at large. And now, of course, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson is a degreed scientist. Uh, Bill Nye, I'm not, I don't think that he, you know, he is as far as qualified to, you know, actually publish papers in science 
science and stuff like that. Neil deGrasse Tyson is. But Voltaire decided, you know what, I'm going to take Newton and I'm going to put it into something that the average person can understand. So Voltaire is one of the first popularizers of science, one of the first people making science accessible. So Voltaire is one of the first popularizers of science, one of the first people to make science popular, trendy, and accessible. And here is a picture of Voltaire writing his book on Newton's philosophy. Now notice that he's not alone. When you look at this picture you see that Voltaire is there writing and there are two figures up there in heaven. And so what we see here is we've got Isaac Newton up there. And then there is a woman. Now notice that Newton's glory is reflecting off of this mirror that is held by this woman and it is going down onto Voltaire. Now who is this woman? This woman was Emily du Chatelet and she was a French mathematician, physicist, and author and also longtime mistress of Voltaire. Uh, she was married to a French nobleman um, who was totally fine with the relationship. Uh, back then a French nobleman could have uh, you know any number of women that he could maintain and his wife could uh, you know could have one man that uh, you know that she uh, was sweet on. And so Emily du Chatelet and Voltaire had this long romantic relationship. At one point they lived in a chateau together which uh, Voltaire actually paid to have renovated. Uh, you know her husband would come visit once in a while and the husband and Voltaire would ride horses together. It's not something that we could really imagine in American society but uh, you know culturally these two had this uh, this relationship that was uh, you know tolerated by all parties and they would spend a great deal of time studying and Voltaire of course drinking coffee and uh, all kinds of stuff and just riding well into the night they would uh, you know spend time together and then they would spend time by themselves working on their various academic projects and Voltaire you know he's with a woman that's actually smarter than he is he knows that he's okay with it now Voltaire called Emily du Chatelet a great man whose only fault was being a woman I'm saying here that if she had been a man and she probably would have been reckoned as one of the great scientific minds of Europe at that time. But since she was a woman, then she was never going to get the respect that she deserved in that society as it existed then. Now there's a book that I would recommend if anybody's interested in the relationship between Voltaire and Emily du Chatelet. It's called Passionate Minds. Uh, it's a great book. Going into their relationship, even after their romance ended, they remained friends. Uh, Voltaire was actually present when she died. She died in childbirth. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, a child by somebody that wasn't Voltaire. It wasn't her husband. Uh, you know, she gave birth to this child and she died. And Voltaire was said to have collapsed, uh, you know, and just been beside himself in grief uh, because he lost this person that was, you know, really the most important person to him in the world. And even in death, you know, she served as his muse, uh, as the person who inspired his work. So when we look at this, uh, you know, when we look at this here, uh, you know, we see that Voltaire is writing about Newton, inspired not only by Newton, but inspired by Emily du Chatelet, who was making this accessible to him. Voltaire was also an advocate of religious toleration. Now, who is he following here? Who's, uh, you know, who's, who set the foundation for Voltaire to be a big crusader for religious toleration? Did I hear? John Locke. Very good. Very good. All right. So John Locke. So he's building on the foundation of John Locke. Now where he, you know, when we think about the scientific revolution compared to the Enlightenment, uh, the difference between Voltaire and John Locke, and this is kind of in a nutshell, uh, is that Voltaire and John Locke were both advocates of religious toleration, but Voltaire was also a critic of Christianity. John Locke actually wrote an essay uh, on the reasonableness of Christianity where he defended Christianity. Sometimes John Locke is falsely uh, portrayed as a deist. Uh, John Locke was a practicing Christian. Now Voltaire was a fierce critic of Christianity, especially of the Catholic Church as it existed in France at that time. And really of any revealed religion. Uh, in Candide, there is a scene where some Muslim pirates are, you know, raping and pillaging and stealing and all the things that pirates do. And then the call to prayer came. And all of a sudden, 
they were all praying. And so these people were observing their religion as far as the religious observance, but they weren't practicing their religion. And so when it came down to it, Voltaire felt like the best thing about religion is that it makes people treat each other better. Voltaire believed that the best thing about religion is it makes people treat each other better. People like Voltaire and Jefferson, uh, you know, were very well read in the teachings of Jesus Christ and actually, you know, spoke and wrote well of Jesus of Nazareth as a philosopher. Uh, but, you know, as far as the Christianity that he saw, he saw that the church was much more concerned about its power and about religious doctrine than it was about the ethical treatment of other human beings and living a good and fulfilling life life. And so Voltaire was an advocate of deism, which uh, is a natural religion. Now, when you think about, uh, you know, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, any of the world's major religions, they tend to focus on divine revelation, uh, which means, like, if you think about the book of Revelation, the Revelation of St. John, when you think about that book, what happens at the very first? St. John's sitting there, and all of a sudden, bam, Jesus shows up, and he's like, I want to show you something, right? And so then he says, let me... Let me show you some things. And so Christianity and any other, you know, revealed religion, it is based on that God has revealed something in particular to a particular person or group of people. So the Jews, for example, believe that the Ten Commandments were handed down to the Israelites through Moses. And so there is a special revelation here through a prophet. And the Judeo-Christian tradition is full of prophets who receive special revelation from God. Now, when it comes down to it, uh, deism says, you know, you really don't need anything to understand God except for nature. Uh, because nature is God's way of communicating with us. So when it comes down to it, for me to believe that, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm going to hell, uh, Jesus has paid for those sins, and if I believe in Jesus, I can go to heaven. Now, this is revealed doctrine. This is not something that I could just go out in the woods and kind of theorize by myself. But deism, certainly, if I think in terms of I'm breathing this air that is a perfect combination of nitrogen and oxygen that, you know, the oxygen doesn't set on fire because it's got the nitrogen to counteract it. I can see because of this very complex, uh, you know, network of whatever. I'm not a scientist. I don't know what makes us see, but it's pretty complex. And then I have intelligence. You think about, uh, you think about Descartes. I think, therefore, I am that I'm thinking. And how does thought animate itself? Now, there are people who are atheists and they come to that conclusion, but you can certainly see absent of religious teaching, somebody could come to the conclusion that there is a higher power. There is a higher intelligence that created the Earth as it is. And when you look at Newtonian physics, Newtonian physics, which makes sense. You know, we still, you know, the scientific community's got more of a chaotic physics today, but Newton's physics is still largely taught in physics classes because people can understand it. It makes sense. Now, when you're taking physics in high school, you probably won't feel like a lot of it makes sense. But... In, con you know, in comparison to other scientific theories, it certainly does. So this natural religion of deism is what Voltaire has in mind when he thinks about God. Of course, a lot of people like Voltaire and Thomas Paine and people like that will be derided in their lifetimes as atheists, but they very much believe in God. In fact, Voltaire said if somebody is an atheist, they're pretty much an idiot. He was very blunt, okay? It's not, it's not nice to talk to people, you know, to talk down about somebody's religious beliefs, but Voltaire didn't care about that. So anyway, that is Voltaire, and in the next segment, we will go on to Dennis Diderot, the editor of the Encyclopedia. Hope you'll join us. See you in a bit.